Corey, thank you so much for being here, sir. I really appreciate it. Oh yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming. It's it's an absolute pleasure on my part, and I'm I'm glad that we're able to do this. You got, I, I I'm assuming that you're in your bedroom as well as I'm in mine. This is a bedroom <laughs> podcast this week. No, I've actually never uh, slept in here. This is my um, studio room. It's where I keep all my equipment. Um, the qu- the equipment is like behind the phone. Um, it's good. Keep it keep keep everything separated behind the phone or the phone behind whatever well, just, else. That's why it doesn't. It just gives the appearance. But you know, there's a guitar over my shoulder. There's gear everywhere. You just can't see it. When did you start getting into music, Corey? How old are you? Oh, geez. Um, I don't. I think. Uh, I I mean I was really into uh, the Offspring when I was in fifth grade. And I would circle around the baseball field during um, recess. And I had a, a little disc man. And I would listen to the record because, you know, keep in mind, there was no internet at this time. So I was trying to listen and just memorize all the lyrics. I wanted to memorize all the lyrics so I could sing all the songs to impress all my friends who already knew all the lyrics. And so it was like this thing about, you know, trying to know the music as well as you possibly could to be the biggest fan of the offspring of, of course and nothing's changed since then you better know all the lyrics to all the songs of the offspring i can still i can still you know jump in and you know i, I remember quite a bit um but it it was through uh what's that song the fucking uh the one the go away Go away, go away. Nah, nah, why don't you get a job? So I was listening to that and my mom chimed in. My mom's a musician as well. And uh, she was like, hey, hold on a second. That's not an Offspring song. And I was like, well, yeah, it is. I'm watching the music video right now. Um, Cause I was all over MTV at the time. And uh, she was like, no, that's a Beatles song. And then I was like, oh, okay. Well, that's old music. No one likes that except for you, mom. Yeah. And only so fan. then she pulled out the white album and it was like, uh, it was like this whole world of, you know, unex- previously unaccessible, like uh, musical sound and, and song craft was just like, boom, it was like opened. And I listened to it and I went, mom, this sucks. I fucking hate this. And, uh, and she was like, well, fuck me then. I guess this kid's a fucking idiot. And then a couple of years later, I started. You, you, you had the correct taste. No, that was, that was, that was a good move. Offspring <laughs> only. That's it. Yeah. Like this is not as good, even close to as good as the Offspring. American. No way. So then I, uh, couple years passed you know then this thing happens where i'm going through what they call puberty and everything about me is changing and i'm having all these like new feelings um and uh and i revisited that record and i remember hearing while my guitar gently weeps and i was like holy shit that guitar is insane and it's still like one of the like wildest it's like how did they get that sound i'm pretty sure they ran the guitar through a leslie cabinet but it's so iconic and like so like there's no other clapton song that has even he doesn't even sound like that really most of the time um so uh that was when i unlocked the you know the world of the beatles and that was kind of how i got into everything else and drugs all at the same time the parents are right beatles would get you into drugs immediately lucy in the sky with diamonds all that uh, we know what they're talking about there oh yeah i mean i remember my mom sat me down and she had this conversation she's like listen so these guys the beatles they were making all this music and they were they were taking a lot of drugs 
okay, because it, it, it turned them into geniuses and then they wrote lots of music and made tons of money. But you, I just want you to know, Corey, young Corey, that you don't have to take lots of drugs to make music. You can do it without the drugs. Right, right. It, you I, won't be the Beatles, but you, you can still make it. You'll just be average and it won't be, you know, really anything to write home about, but there'll be songs, you know, and then you'll write them. But yeah. You will, you will pen lyrics and, and it will, it, it will be reflective of your sober state of mind. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's, so. and that's, that's a, that's a tough kind of conversation you have to have with your children, especially if they're into music or if they're just listening to music, you won't truly experience it unless you're, you're high. I mean, that's, yeah. and, and that's, that's the age old thing. I mean, because parents didn't understand what, you know, Elvis was doing because they weren't all twacked out on stuff. So, you know. Oh, a lot of them were, you know, <laughs> but, uh, cause everyone was taking uh speed back then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everyone, everyone, the, all of those boomers, you know, they're all addicted to some kind of speed. Either they were like just getting it as a stimulant, you know, so they could do their jobs or they diet pills or you know like everybody everybody was high as hell um but i've yeah since my mom and i had that conversation i've remained sober you know forever and my um you know success or lack thereof reflects that in a lot of ways now what are you sipping on now Corey? what, what yep. is your this is, is coffee also a drug that's not straight edge no way caffeine yeah no i know i gotta go i gotta go uh get my one day chip again i guess yeah i am hopelessly addicted to caffeine like uh it has overtaken my life you know um and uh, and i don't know how if i can crawl out of that that world that hole but I mean, we'll that's, that's, that, that's your creative juice. That's how you make your music is, is through caffeine. I would say that, yeah, it's how I do most things. Like every, every single activity is um, driven by that. And my, my general like disposition throughout the day um, is, uh, yeah. And, and, and the Fueled by caffeine. <laughs> The, the lack, you know, like how shitty I feel in the morning, how little I'm like able to like get quality sleep and all that stuff. So it all ties in together. I know this, you know, and yet still I'm here. Still abusing, Hopeless, still abusing it. Hopelessly addicted to caffeine. <laughs> Moving back to, to music and, your, and, and your, your fascination with it fueled by caffeine. So this is around high school that you started picking up the guitar uh middle school middle school yeah and i was definitely like i want a solo i don't want to play this rhythm bullshit that's for dorks i want a solo i want to be like Jimi hendrix and so i just started soloing i just started doing one string things and um and then my uncle he uh he kind of got me started he was like my guitar teacher it, it, you know i never really had a guitar teacher but he was the one that showed me like your scales and stuff and he was this he's kind of he's still around he's a trippy guy uh but he he had spent some time in a mental hospital because he dropped acid at a, a pink floyd the wall concert and just had a mental collapse um and then he was uh yeah he was in a mental hospital for 10 years nearly a decade and then he got out and then he started teaching me how to play guitar um and one of my first memories of that is was he was like oh i got this buddy we'll go we'll go to whittier um i got this old friend i used to play drums with in high school he's awesome he's a terrible alcoholic but you know and my my uncle's a sober aa guy and uh and uh so we went over to this guy's house and i was like 14 i was with uh chad yubovich from the meat bodies and my brother casey who i play with in in this in this new band 
slow hand. And uh, so we're, we knock on this door and then this old lady answers and is like, oh, is, you know, John there? And then she's like, John, you know, and goes and gets him. And he's just like already drinking a fucking 40 ounce of King Cobra. And we go into his backyard and he just has this like kind of incredible, um, like it's kind of like a mosaic, like maze of 40 ounce bottles that he's drank. So he keeps all the 40 ounce bottles and he made them into this like beautiful, like um, uh shell like spiral formation and uh then we went into his garage and he had put just like on all the wall every single it, the whole thing was like coated in fucking uh playboy spreads it was like you know boobs and ass you know and vagina on every wall and then he just like sits at the drum kit this like old beat up ludwig kit um and then just like fucking chugs this King Cobra, sets it down and then just like, boom, electric funeral. And then, and they just played it like perfectly while, you know, we're all like, oh my God, there's boobs everywhere. Electric funerals playing, you know, it was like very formative. Yeah. I mean, leave it going, going to Whittier. I mean, that's where all the music, the best musicians reside, A, B. Uh, I think that he was a part of a, a, a art collective to be, collecting all these bottles and yeah. pinup girls, you know, and, and plaster them on the wall. Like you need an inspiration to make music. I, right? it seems like he, he really tapped in on what was making him tick, which is good. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel ashamed, you know, I'm looking at all these bare walls. Yeah. I, wh yeah. Where are you, wh where are you at on it? Yeah. Cause there's, I don't, I, I don't see anything, but maybe, maybe after this. I got this ZZ Top poster. That's all I got. It's a good start. Yeah. Yeah. Whittier, Whittier is a great place. Now, I know that because Chad has been on here and go check out that interview if you haven't already. Great, great guy. Um, he's from uh, Monrovia. Yeah. Are, are you also from Monrovia? I, well, Chad and I, our, our parents taught together for many, many years. And I think also before we existed. So um, we all grew up in the San Gabriel Valley, which is like a pretty large, um, you know, zone. There's uh, South Pasadena, Pasadena, Altadena, uh, Monrovia. And then it goes east into Arcadia. Uh, and then it eventually, you know, goes into West Covina and then the Inland Empire. So, um, it, it it sort of connects like east and northeast LA to the Inland Empire. It's like in between. And so he grew up further east than I did, like by a little bit. But we lived, you know, for a while we were living like within a half mile of each other. And um, but we just hung out every, you know, moment that we could, <laughs> like bestie style. Well, there's a lot of garages, you know like where where it, it's very um suburban so chad had a garage i had a garage for a minute i had a back house like in high school that was like the designated like jam zone but there were places where like pe we could get together and we ended up like there was a lot of people uh coming through at that time that i still you know like a uh, Chad's drummer Dylan uh, Fujioka who plays in a bunch of different bands and uh, Patrick Shiroishi and Noah from Meat Bodies as well like we were all just meeting up we had never even like met each other and we we're like yeah let's just jam you know sort of like uh, kind of coming out of like I don't know like skate park culture where you just like meet other skaters and you're like hey where are you from oh Victorville that's fucking far what are you doing <laughs> um so it was a lot of that and uh yeah so we were just like improvising from a very young age um together and had like a zillion bands that lived for you know three months and then would just fizzle out that's a long time that's yeah. a, 
putting in the hours. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, we, yeah, we lived, those bands lived a lifetime in our, in our, you know, everything's slower when you're younger. Everything's like start, starting to like ramp up in this weird way. Now that I'm in my thirties, that's like terrifying to me where I just like, it feels like that movie click where I'm just like fast forward, making coffee in the morning, you know, fast forward. So fast yeah. Forward three- to the effect of caffeine, of course, that's where you want to be at. You don't oh, yeah. want to be drinking it. You want to be just feeling it. Like a true addict. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Adam, what of Adam Sandler's best um, films? I don't say movies. I say films because if, if, if it's Adam Sandler, it's a, it's a piece of cinema, really. It kind of is, isn't it? He's, yeah. he's such uh that movie is amazing and it, i cry every time i watch it i'm gonna admit right now yeah. men don't talk about this stuff but i cry at the end of click every fucking time and uh i think that the thing about adam sandler that sets him apart from you know the rob schneiders the david spades uh Kevin James, Chris Rock, these kind of these kind of guys. Yeah. Well, Kevin James is better than Adam Sandler in every way. That's a that's a that's a bold point to make. <laughs> I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying that's a who. I think he's he Kevin James is very underrated as a as a comedic actor. But uh King Adam Queens, Qu- for example. I mean, sheesh. Look at oh, look, exactly. look at that classic. Um but but the Sandman is just a fucking incredible actor in every single thing that he does. It doesn't matter how shitty it is. He just, he can't help himself, you know? That's a whole other conversation, I guess. That's, yeah. That's a, that's another podcast I do. And, and you're going to, you're going to come on it and, t- and talk about the Sandman, but we'll, 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 we'll get there later. But this one's mainly about music. Um, Yeah. <laughs> go, going back to that though. Uh, Now, Flashing forward a bit, uh, past high school, you were in that Cal Arts scene, right? Yeah, I went to Cal Arts. I was a fine art major. Ooh, at Cal Arts, yeah, it's pretty good. It was. It was great. It was so much fun. Uh, it was like, I mean, it just, it it was the perfect age because I was, you know, like. 19 and i thought i knew everything about everything i was like i listened to fucking captain beefheart and tom bitch and then you know someone was like oh yeah do you like us maple and i was like what you know and uh so yeah a lot of things it was like very much like a quantum boom development in in uh I met every single person that I play with now through Cal Arts. Every single person in Wand, um, every person in my solo band except for my brother. Uh, you, you met him outside of school, I'm assuming, or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did. Sorry to backtrack there. I just I I just want to know the origin points of everybody. Yeah. He just showed up at my house one day, and never left. Um, it's pretty, pretty pretty good roommate scenario there. Not to go on Craigslist or anything. It's just bingo there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it was cool because I was in the art program. I didn't want to study music, but music was like my, you know, thing. And so I was kind of in between worlds a little bit in the art program. Um, and the music school was very, uh, the art school and the music school were very conceptual. So it was like very, the, uh, the things that everyone was studying were like, like in the music program was like new, uh, neoclassical or like new music, um, like John Cage and, uh, Steve Reich and, and then a lot of jazz too. Uh, then the art program was like a very conceptual, it was started by, um, founded by this guy, Michael Asher and a bunch of other um, 
West Coast conceptual artists. And, uh, and Walt Disney, of course. So it was a good match of uh, like Walt, who I didn't, I didn't catch that last one, but it's Walt it's, Disney. He's I, my birthman. Got to got to look that guy up after this. Right. Yeah. So some, so some, some, some lesser known guys perusing yeah. the, the, the art field at Cal arts. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was, it's an underdog school. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was cool. It was a good place to like experiment with, you know, drugs and sex and caffeine and music and, and yeah, caffeine, hmm. cigarettes, yeah. smoked a lot of cigs. You smoke cigarettes now? Fuck no. They make Ca- me feel like shit. It took caffeine me only. It took me like 15, 20 years to realize that these things make me feel like shit. Like every day. They just make it life harder to live. So now I don't, yeah. It was like, I smell bad. I smell like shit. I feel mm-hmm. like shit. That's just, that's, that, that's RJ Reynolds for you right there. That's the selling point. You want to feel like shit? You want to smell like shit? Cigarettes. There you go. <laughs> what year are we kind of talk about here at, at, at Cal Arts? Is this around 2010 ish? This is, I started going there in 2007. So uh, to put it into music cultural relevance, Meriwether Post Pavilion hadn't dropped yet. Okay, so got that's. You. So you, you you get out of there and uh, immediately is was wand happening somewhat or in some capacity at this time during school or was that after leaving? Did that kind of start to form? I had like a psychedelic rock band like a whatever kind of artsy rock band called um magic mountain and that was sort of the 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 seed for what became wand but that you know wand didn't happen until 2013 so like a few years after two years after i got out of cal arts uh, but immediately, like once I was done um, with school, I think like a few months after I graduated, I went on tour. Uh, well, immediately I moved to New York first and I fucking hated it. So I went straight back to L.A. And then I uh, started touring in Michael Cronin's band because uh, he was my roommate at CalArts for two years and so through and uh through michael i mean i'd known also i knew ty from when we were like 15 or something playing shows in la with his band the epsilons the um epsilons. the epsilons which pretty, is like a dance punk band pretty good names i mean magic mountain and i i'm assuming that it would have gone further if you didn't get a cease and assist from magic mountain i'm i'm assuming that that was the downfall of that there's a wait from the theme park no yeah yeah that that you you got it or did you send them one which is that's a baller move if you did oh, you're just like hey you need to change the name of this because that's well, my band's awesome. name is this with the suing you know you shoot first mm-hmm. sure Whoever got, shoots it. First. got to get that litigation going so maybe I'll bring it back, but I think there might be a Magic Mountain now. I don't know. Um, I, I, again, whoever serves papers first usually wins. That's just the statistics right there. Um, yeah, yeah. The, there was, yeah. There, the names were better back then, and then I settled on Wand. How yeah. did you? How did you settle on Wand? Uh, well, it was just. I don't even fucking remember. It just seemed like, okay, that's a good, that, that'll that uh, pass as a band name. It's a band name, let's go. You know, it's one letter away from band. So. And that's the, uh, that's a line that you got to kind of, kind of breach as when picking a name for a band. It, how close is it to the word band? Exactly. 
So you, you started one 2013 ish. And from, from there, was it immediately like, yeah, this, this is gonna, this is gonna last. I'm going to, I'm going to keep on doing this. You could, you, you saw a future for this maybe. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think it, it immediately uh, started to add up. Like people were just paying attention to it immediately and nobody had ever given a shit about anything that I did except for like, you know, the, the people at Cal arts and whatnot who were, you know, just the people I was seeing every day. We didn't have any interaction with the outside world. It was like a little, little bubble. Why, um, why do you think that people started paying attention looking back on it now? Well, uh, probably because it was like really fucking awesome, good music, like good shit. And everyone was like, of course, as it is now, nothing's changed since then. Yeah, no, it's just gotten better, you know. Our our product has just got has just improved. Absolutely. Um, but uh yeah, I think well, I know Ty was having quite a moment himself and then he started his record label, God Records. God? With a question mark? Yes, there is there's a question mark in there. We're looking at 10 years now. A decade of one. That's true. Yeah. I I think it has been almost 10 years. It's like nine and a half. I think we started in the summer. Like September, I think. Was when uh, the band got together. Has has there been any major changes since since the, the, the beginning of this of this adventure? Yeah, sure. There's been a, quite a few. Uh, I mean, the lineups have just, they just keep on changing. Um, right now, I think Evan Burroughs is the only original member. But I think we're just, we just keep getting better and better. Like, the more that we um, consolidate and uh, the more shit that we go through and the more successes, the more failures, you know, <laughs> the, you, you just, it's a, it's a repetitive cycle where you just get better and better as a result, which is cool. You know, there's gains to be made. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the first sort of success that you, that you encountered with the band? You're like, Oh my gosh. All right. We're, we're, we're moving somewhere now. Uh, the first success, I think it was the day that our record came out and it had sold out the ganglion reef, like the first day it was like, Oh, they're all gone. And I was like, Oh, there's no more. Like, yeah, we have to press more immediately. And it was in the, you know, in, at that time you could press a record in like a month. So it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't like now where it's like really shitty if a record goes out of print because then you have to get in a line, you know, that's two years long. That's uh, like we're still waiting on represses of fucking Golem. It's been like three years. But it's coming. Oh, yeah. For those, for those who are interested, it, it, it's, it's on its way. How do you feel about people? when you're playing and all you see is phones in the, in the audience, does that make you feel good that they're, that they think it's, it's great that they're documenting it or. It kind of makes me think that I need to out document them because it, it bothers me. The thing that bothers me about it is that they're, they're just taking clips of like uh, 15 seconds of something. And I want to like, just, in my mind, it'd be cool to just have every show filmed like and documented and like with a board feed or whatever, and just like make an archive of all those things. Because, yeah, I just think like at the end of the day, people are going to have all of these like tiny little clips of things that they're like, oh, I need it to be 15 seconds. So it fits on Instagram, you know, so it fits on short, short form video format. And they're going to be like, wait, but 
what else happened outside of this thing, it sort of defeats the purpose of documentation. But maybe it wasn't ever about that. It was just about being like, look, I'm here at the Wan show. You have FOMO now because you're not here, you know, whatever. Do you experience that through other people's stories and whatnot on, on Instagram and all these different things? Like, oh, I should have went to that. Oh, all the time. Have you ever seen one that you're like, I'm glad I didn't go to that? All the time. Okay. All right. Pretty, pretty even. I I mean, I, I go to tons of shows. Like I, I, uh, I'm always out, you know, you're on about you're, you're, you're man about town. Right now. I keep up appearances first of all that's sure. part of one's got to know when the king is you know that that, that a foot that they need to you know i gotta watch this throne you know someone else might try and swoop in heavy is your head because it wears the crown sure yeah so so i gotta you know make it make it known throughout mm. i gotta wear the crown around mm. And uh, so, but yeah, no, I also just, I, there's tons, I live in LA, it's, it's fucking, there's good shows every half day, you know, whatever, like there's good shows like twice a day, three times a day, three, yeah. every night, something going on that I, I feel like I, it completely slipped my mind and I missed. It's, it's Coachella up there is what it is. Oh, yeah. Do you remember the, the the first show that you went to? It, it like changed your your mind about how how you make your own music. Has there ever been a pivotal show like that? There's been so many, um, and I'm always really uh, I always see something like I, it. The first one, fuck. That'd be that'd be kind of tough. Um, I remember when I was in fifth grade, my mom had this drummer who was in a uh, like a kind of like gothy industrial, like Marilyn Manson type whiskey a go go band. You know, like band that would play on the Sunset Strip or whatever. And that that band was called Carbon Nine, and she gave me a copy of the CD that I, you know, pulled out my Offspring CD, put this CD in. Oh, change changing of the guards there. Yeah, to, I know to, to replace Offspring. Big big shoes to fill. Anyways, this but this brought me closer in proximity. You know, this bridge because before that, my mom was just involved in music that I like really didn't want anything to do with. It's like country, like CMT, like top forty country shit. Um, the best country of all time a- absolutely uh then so then i got uh this the cd and i was just listening to it and i was like god this music's so dark and scary but it's like making me feel kind of evil and cool and so i really wanted to go to a show and my mom brought me to one of their shows at the whiskey it was the first time i ever went to the whiskey and uh it was just fucking there was two like women dancing in cages and they were like all dressed in like cyberpunk shit you know like had like cyborg arms and were dancing and then there was uh, a man on stilts just like walking through the crowd like it was like a it, like industrial like freak show and then there was like a little person that they had hired who was like also dancing in the crowd and like had a top hat and a monocle or something and that just blew my fucking mind it was like uh yeah totally changed my idea of what performance could be and i haven't gotten there yet you know to doing the women dancing in cages but mm-hmm. and the man I, on stilts and the little person in a monocle and a top hat but you're, you're getting there right that's i mean because the, the next tour is around the corner and i mean who knows what what you'll bring to town oh yeah and i that's i like that you know like uh i like keeping my fans kind of surprised you know maybe there will be a person on stilts 
maybe there will be a little person in a monocle. Um, but yeah, that was really, that, that um, stuck with me, obviously. I can still, I remember it very vividly, being like a 11 year old kid. You, you, so you had a pretty good fake ID to get in there, right? Well, I, th I was, um, I think you could get in with a parent, like an adult. So it was fine. Or we got guest listed or something. When you started WAND, again, 2013, 10, sorry, nine and a half years ago now, where were you performing? Where, where would be like the places that you, you would you try to get shows at or you would get shows at? We played at Lot One, which was on Sunset near Echo Park Avenue. And uh, it's gone now. It doesn't exist anymore. We played the Echo a lot. Did a bunch of like DIY shows and stuff. Um, and then open for people, open for Ty. I think we opened for Mac DeMarco one time at the Fonda. Uh, so we did a lot of that stuff. What was the craziest thing you ever seen at a DIY show? Oh, DIY show. I'd say the craziest thing, I don't know if this qualifies as a DIY show, but it was an unofficial um, south by southwest showcase i'll take it i'll take it where um my friend uh plays under the moniker mom m-o-m she uh had this she had this project called mom and uh where she would wear this like mask that was kind of horrifying and um would get like essentially naked and had this like pitch shifter on her voice that made her voice really high and then she would just play tapes and it was like a, a big performance thing um but at this time she had somehow uh gotten like a like a middle-aged man uh kind of a heavier middle-aged man to just like wear a diaper and put on a baby head like mask baby mask so she, he was wearing this baby mask and then she like would have this big dog bowl out and then she would fill it with milk and then she would piss in the bowl and he would drink it. With the milk, piss mixed with milk. He, yeah, he would drink it. And uh, then, and this uh, particular occasion, I'd seen this a couple times. Um, I'd say I was a fan and... <laughs> This particular time there was like a brunch happening at this was at the spider house uh in austin and and uh so these these uh like industry bros these two industry bros were sitting um like drinking bloody mary's and eating a brunch and she just took this bowl of milk and piss and she just walked right up to him and just dumped it on their heads and at the it, brunch show oh man at the brunch show and it it uh yeah it was maybe the craziest thing i've seen at a, a diy show what did what did the bros do they were reasonably upset and but also it was so unclear to them like what the past you know that I, obviously I think they wanted to do something about what had happened, but I think they just left and, and we're like, we need to change our clothes. And so bring it somewhere else. Did they not see your piss in the, in the bowl? They, they did. Which oh, they, was, they, they saw it. They were there. They were, they knew what, what, what they were drenched in. Yeah. Yeah, they did. They were fully aware as we were all aware what they were drenched <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was fucking cool. Uh, another time <laughs> I saw this band, the Monotonics, um, which are a rock band from Israel. The singer, they, it was it was at the Smell, and the they they started like 
throwing the drum kit up and the singer was standing on top of the drum kit like on they they had flipped the bass drum over it so that he was standing on the skin of the drum and then he pulled down his pants and shoved the microphone up his ass and then he said oh gg allen was in that band yeah 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 i know what you're talking about now and and then the drummer had a snare and a hi-hat still and he just poured soy sauce i don't know where he got the soy sauce he just poured soy sauce all over his snare and just started fucking smashing it so the whole crowd was getting covered in just with the spray of soy sauce and uh and then they carried the drummer out or the singer who was still on the drum they just like carried him out into the alley and the whole crowd just like marched around that block you know with him and then like brought him back in it was it, it, these were magical times these, this was the height of you know like uh the di the big diy boom sure but sure before this is pre meriwether post pavilion mm-hmm. just to just just to give the time stamp on it now did you think that when the lead singer is being carried out on the on the drum on the bass drum did you feel like oh they're just gonna like start loading loading out and like they're they're starting with the big stuff before, <laughs> or did you think that, that, that were, he's gonna eventually get back in there oh they yeah everybody came back in eventually yeah but did you did you feel like like that like they were gonna bring it back inside or did you feel like that was it that, that was gonna be the end of the show oh no it felt like it had to return okay it did so that was like the common feeling between everybody that was there oh yeah oh, okay yeah. Because I I feel like if I was there, I'd be like, oh, okay, this is it. Like we're we're done here. I would have I would have might have gone home early, perhaps. And then that would have been FOMO on my end. Like, oh, what he went back inside? Like that's yeah, a big reveal. I nobody, I think everyone there, I mean, I was like, I was probably like 16, 17. <laughs> so I, I didn't want to miss anything, you know. No, I wanted no. to stay around until they locked the door, mm-hmm. you know, in the in the the last one in the alley the diy thing like really it's a shame how much it slid off you know and 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 how corporatized that whole thing because you can't you know now you got the fucking what was that the big the big band tribute to rage against the machine like that lady's pissing on people's faces now yeah 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 there was somebody that that did piss on that guy recently I don't know though. I'm just a cranky old man now. I guess everything sounds the same. Lady Does it? pissing here, lady pissing there. Yeah, it's all the same. Oh, when piss hits the floor, it all kind of sounds the same. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah, we get not it. Really, not really about the uh, music, you know. That the piss actually okay. There, there was this band that was about the piss being music. This band. Uh, yellow tears have you ever heard of this band nope not not until right now i met the sing. i met the singer from this band i wouldn't i don't know if i can call him the singer he's like the guzzler oh okay yeah throat singing technique that he does where he puts like contact mics on his throat and then he takes like uh, a bunch of glasses filled with piss and then he just chugs them and it's about the sound that it makes in his throat uh, I think that's how he did it, and then you know ran that through like effects and stuff. And but that was that was a yeah. I met him once. He's like you know quiet guy, shy, Spirit, shy guy, classic shy guy. <laughs> that's what is he pissing on stage as well, or is it is a pre piss? I think he uh, in the cup and drinks it, but also just has piss. You know, kind of like Howard Hughes. He's just got a a a, a seller. <laughs> what what a great uh, reference! I really like it. <laughs> Didn't think I'd hear Howard Hughes uh, reference on this one. <laughs> yeah, he did the same thing. He got a Howard Hughes thing going on. You know what I mean? Sure, sure, sure. Drinking classic, milk, pissing in the box. HH. Yeah. <laughs> Look, if you're a multimillionaire, that's going crazy. You know, that's way that, that maybe maybe they get the guy from what Yellow Tears is a multimillionaire. Might be Howard Hughes's kid. Oh yeah, 
I mean, I think, I mean, as a multimillionaire myself, it's <laughs> the urge to not uh, drink my own piss. I fight it every day. It must be hard moving back to to music once again. I don't know how we keep on veering away from it, but I do. I do like the side I, roads that we're going down. I keep doing these piss tangents, like every single one about piss. When you were starting this, and and obviously as you mentioned before, Michael Michael Cronin and uh, um, Ty Segal and all these different people that you're playing with, did you feel like oh this is going to be like a change, a change of pace, a turning of the tide for for music and indie music? to put a, the cover over that did you feel like oh this is uh things are changing um i kind of think it yeah sort of i mean we were all really sick of the fucking garage shit it was like it, it just kept coming back to to that it was like it, it, I don't know how to really like everyone I knew was just like, well, really this fucking garage thing just keeps getting like bigger and bigger. And I think that all of us were, um, you know, like really pushing away from that world and, and feeling like t totally like alien to that stuff. Um, when Tide started doing the muggers, band that was uh like the apex of that of trying to you know reject that garage shit for him for me it never really was that much of an issue because i just don't really fit into any of that shit anyways and it's really hard i can't like really do genre exercise music like faithfully because it just doesn't interest me. And I know now is like a time when, when genre exercise is just like, it, people are so obsessed with it. Um, and I just, yeah, I don't see the, I don't get any fulfillment, you know, listening to that shit. Being like some, like I don't listen I, to genre music. Like I don't go like, wow, this, um, Miles Davis, you know, like mid seventies Miles Davis record is uh, so amazing. I should just listen uh, to any jazz record. It doesn't matter what the fuck it is. I just, I'll just take it, you know, cause it's like, well, there's tons of fucking garbage jazz. Um, like Miles like, Davis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like Miles Davis. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but, uh, and, and I feel the same, like, oh, I love Wire. Like, oh, I love these first two Wire records. Not the third one. I don't like that one. But uh, the first two uh, are so good. I guess I just, I got to listen to every fucking post-punk record. It's like, there's so much garbage in that, in that genre. Like Gang of Four, for instance, you know? Uh, and yeah, so so I just pick out what I do mostly is I just pick out records. I get obsessed with them, you know, and I, and I kind of fixate on them and I and I idealize them in a lot of ways. Uh, and then and I and I use those things as a way to like. I direct that what you know, what I'm gaining from that record to like try to like focus it on something that I'm creating. How how often is it? Uh, is it does it uh, appear that way when you listen back to it from where it came from, and what you do with it? Does it just change formation so many times, or is is there still like a oh I I see where I got that from and where we are with the final result? If that makes any sense. Yes, I mean the seed is still there, you know, in the in the you know, flower or whatever. It's like, you can still, I can still, um, the, the, I mean, the origin of it is always unfocused, but uh, I can still be like, oh, you know, I was listening to Rated X by Miles Davis. And that was what turned into, you know, White Cat by Wand or whatever. It has your your influences like that like whatever it would inspire you like oh I, I love this album I'm gonna make I'm gonna try to make my version of this album or I'm trying to 
replicate re- replicate some of the sounds that are within the, this song into one of my songs do the origins of those of the songs that you're making in that way uh, always change? Are you always looking towards the same thing or are you constantly expanding? Like, Oh, I really like that sound. Let me try to implement that within my own sound. I think, um, I think the things that, that stick are like uh, moods. Like I'll go for like a, a mood or a tone. So like for my first solo record, I was listening to a lot of Songs of Love and Hate by Leonard Cohen. And I just loved the, how like bare everything was and um, stripped down. But then there's like these like lush arrangements that kind of like they uh, are almost like they get in the way of the songs. And so sometimes they're supporting, sometimes they're, you know, like directly interfering or something and uh i'll think about those kinds of things but yeah usually i i don't i don't try to um pre-conceptualize what i'm doing too much because it it limits the um it it kind of inhibits the possibilities you know and and to me music is even when you're making it, it's all about listening. It's all about um, uh, listening and, and reacting to to uh, what is you know emerging from from the thing and how you're emotionally responding to it. It's like the same whether it's whether it's like working on like a multi-track recording or just working on something on an acoustic guitar or a piano or, you know, just playing electric guitar, you know, in an improvisation with a band or, or by myself, you know, it's all about, that's the cool thing about performance and music is that you can, um, it's like instantaneous when you play a note and then you like emotionally react to that note. And that is like a, what I perceive as like an honest, interaction or something and then you react to that and then it's like you know it immediately like coalesces into like an improv that's that's directing where you're going to go further if it's an improvisational yeah uh, show or performance rather does yeah do your the, the way that you uh, emotionally react to songs that you made in 2014 for instance has that changed since originally recording them and how you originally felt making that or even piecing the ideas for songs together oh yeah i think i i um my compositional interests have changed uh quite a bit oh that's a good way to put it i like that (laughs) i i like that that terminology i i think that um when I was starting out, I just, I, I had a more limited understand, like idea of performance. And I was like very new to doing this stuff. Um, and it's, it's weird because I, I see a lot of people get jaded through touring and like performing night after night after night and just feeling like, you know, I just want, you know, to do the Adam Sandler click thing and just, you know, fast forward through this whole fucking scenario and just take the money and whatever. But I can't like really put into words how beneficial that grind has been to like um, the way that I think about my own performance, you know, and the the way that that has evolved and, and like my um my like musical sensibility you know as in regards to melody and rhythm and and uh interacting with other players and and also just in terms of songwriting like what i my interests have they they're always shifting um and becoming something else depending on what is like really moving me in that in this particular moment 
which is a, bl a, a blessing, you know, because I would hate to be uninspired. That would be the fucking worst. And have, I, you, ever, have you ever felt uninspired? Honestly, I don't think I have. I, I think that, like, there's so many different kinds of music. Like, it's difficult for me to be to to yeah see something and not be inspired you know and for it to be complete like almost completely you know uh divorced or like to have a separation between like what i do and what they do it's like um you know going to a like i saw wolf eyes a few months ago very inspiring um i saw like a this uh persian hammer dulcimer guy very inspiring um but in terms of my own songwriting i can get very dull for sure and feel like fuck what is, what am i doing here that's kind of my um default state <laughs> it's just like what's going on what the fuck is this like what it, what is happening but it, it eventually gets un unraveled and pieced together yeah at some point yeah is there do you do you separate what you do in wand and what you put out under your own name is are those two completely separate things in your eyes or is it all just like un under the umbrella of making music um i definitely i treat them both with equal importance um I think when I started doing solo records, I they they were taking a long time because Wand was was um, prioritized in, in a lot of ways. So uh, now now it's kind of fifty fifty, and the processes are completely different. Like Wand is like entirely. Uh, I wouldn't even call it democratic because there's no structure. It's like a rotating power structure that is like constantly shifting, but is like mostly uh, just improvising, like just recording improvisations and and turning them into songs in the style of like uh, mid seventies Miles records or Can or those kraut rock bands, I guess. Um, and then my songs are more traditional songwriting. It's like Randy Newman sitting at a piano, you know. Do you see a, a, a difference, going, going back to, to Wand for a minute, do you see a difference between what you, what you were doing with the, the first album, um, with, uh, with I get, please, I, I always think it's gang, Ganglion, but it's yeah. not. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I I, I always feel like I say it wrong. Okay. Gang Ganglion Reef and the most recent one with Spiders in the Rain. Right. That was like technically the the um the live album. That's the most recent one. Yeah. Is do you see a, a stark difference between how you were doing those two, in the in the time in between those two? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, the first record was just entirely me. I wrote everything. I, I wrote the drums, I wrote the uh, every instrument and um, the the live record obviously is a live record uh, where we figured out some shit that is now kind of becoming the next thing, like the 20 minute white cat that we, we uh, stitched together, or rather Robbie and Zach and uh, Evan stitched together um, was a kind of it, it 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 revealed to us like this new form of working where like oh shit we can just like put shit just sew it just edit it together and it's fucking awesome so that. Uh, yeah, the process has changed uh, a lot. I mean, that first record, I uh, was really 
trying to nail a style too in more not in like a genre exercise way but just like oh i have an idea i want to nail this thing um and i want it to be uh, like i was very specific about how i wanted all the the treatment of all the instruments to sound and stuff and with this uh with the newest record which isn't out yet um which we still have to finish it's a lot more um how all of us want it to sound and mostly how Robbie wants it to sound because he's like the engineer uh, and also guitar player, but he's mostly just sonically fucking in it. He's in it, man. He's like in, really inside of it. He's really listening. He's listening so that I don't have to. It's great. Deal. Uh... Cause like with a good band, it's like you, that's the best thing. That's the best feeling is like, okay, you got this. You got the drums. You're fucking awesome at those. I don't even have to think about them. Because whatever you do, I think is genius. And then like, okay, the production, like the engineering, you got this. You're, for some reason, you're fucking amazing at it. And you didn't go to school for it or anything. And then it leaves me to just be like, to just have my own, you know, personal crises about lyrics and <laughs> guitar playing <laughs> imposter syndrome um caffeine, caffeine induced, withdrawals <laughs> withdrawals or, or caffeine induced uh what i call my late afternoon panic attacks yeah. when i head over the coffee shop <laughs> whatever you got to deal with to get this album there's a lot a lot a lot of pressure the heat is on um yeah uh in in going going uh forward to your to your solo stuff you got a new new album coming out western come that's right now what what number is this uh for albums that, that you've separately re or independently released not independently but this third, solo this is the third solo record yes there it is i was searching for it you you found it all right third wow now did it how how what was the time duration between the the second one and this third one uh fuck i think we finished the second record in february of 2020 and then i think i started recording the next one uh like a year later wow but you know back to back sort of i mean there was nothing to fucking do you know it was like real shitty pandemic time losing my fucking mind i remember those days copy induced does anyone you know like really remember those days i feel like everyone's people yeah people like to tune it out and i i i, I, I can understand that i get that I see where they're coming from. Now I got to ask you this, and this is Western Come, C U M. Yeah. Where did the 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 title come from? Uh, well, I wrote a song called Western Come, and uh, it's it didn't make it onto the record. And I just picked it out of like, you know, running through the titles for the record and running through the songs and just being like, what the fuck do I call this thing? And then Western Come is just like, oh, that kind of like sums it up in a lot of ways. It's bold. It's yeah. I mean, it's a, I, I like it as a title because there's no other record called Western Come and there probably never will be another record called Western Come. Um I think Bill Evans had one I want to say I'll I'll check back on that. It is yeah. Eastern Come or something. No, uh, uh Eastern Come? Yeah, Eastern Come. Yeah. The Bill the Bill, the Bill Evans trio. Um, right. But right. I mean besides that, yeah. No, that's it's definitely that's a that is a uh uh very original name, I'd say. Does that one have the someday my prince will come on it? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
C U M, not the other Bill Evans trio record, but the someday. My- he did the two. I forgot about that. Yeah, uh, lesser known one. Yeah, that's a, that's a deep cut, man. You like you like your Bill Evans? I do. I really do like my Bill Evans. What do you want people to take away from the music that you create? Oh, anything, really. Or nothing. I mean, I kind of think that's the great thing about music. Like I was explaining in the beginning to tie it all together. When I listened to that first time I listened to White Album and my mom was trying to show me something that uh, she really thought I was going to like and I fucking hated it, but then came around to it years later and it really changed a lot of things for me. And I love that about music is that, you know, you can hear, like, I've heard a Bill Evans track fucking a million times as a kid. My dad's a jazz uh, pianist. And I always thought it was garbage. Or I just thought it was like, this isn't even, where do I begin with this? Like, what is, what is this? And now I listen to it and, and it's like the only thing I want to hear. So I love that about music that it, it can do everything for someone and it can also do nothing i think that also it, it's more um nothing to something than something to nothing unless you're like me you know like me, like yesterday i was talking to someone about how i used to love the talking heads and now i fucking hate the talking heads i think it's garbage music i just don't like david byrne i think he's annoying um or tom waits or something where it's like i, I don't like this music i think it's bad but I loved it, you know, when I was younger. Um, but for the most part, I I will go from nothing, feeling nothing about something, and then all of a sudden it hits me. I'm like, you know, I just want to hear Ornette play anything. I want to hear uh, fucking Sonny Chirac. You know, I want to hear Jimi Hendrix. Um, I want to listen to Stardust. Willie Nelson record. Um, yeah, just things or uh, what is what a Sinatra. I've been listening to a lot of Sinatra recently. It's like all and, of a sudden, what and, the fuck? And Meat Bodies and Ty Seagal, right? And like <laughs> those guys as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, Corey, I I really appreciate you coming on here, man. It was an absolute pleasure chatting with you. But before I let you go, I got some promo to do here. So, Juan's music is streaming everywhere. Uh, you can get the albums through dragcity.com or through the Bandcamp, which is at um, wand.bandcamp.com. You can stay up to date with news, shows, and releases, and everything else like that by following them on Instagram at wand. Or sorry, wandband.info. And you can buy the merch at wandband.bigcartel.com, right? That's Those are the best places to do all those things? Yeah, sure. You can do it there. You go to Drag City. Awesome, awesome. And uh, your solo stuff, uh, it's also streaming everywhere. Uh, and the people can buy your music through dragcity.com as well, right? Yep. Awesome. And through the band camp, coreyhanson.bandcamp.com. And like we were talking about before, Western Come is out June 23rd on Drag City. And uh, the people can pre-order the, the album now as as this is being released i believe please do please pre-order yeah and and slow hand that's that's the new project right yeah that's the band that's what it's called obviously awesome. we can't call it slow hand but that's to me that's just what the band is and always will be slow hand no matter what it's called that's what it is yeah awesome and uh is there any place to go get information on that or it's it's coming soon more information uh, the information on slow hand mm-hmm, mm-hmm. well i there yeah it's not really it's only in the liner notes of the uh record the western cum record but that's the the western cum band slow oh, hand okay okay oh you know slow hand is coming to a city near you uh soon 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 and slow and do we have anything else Corey, before we stop recording here uh no we're good very well Corey. Thanks. thank you so much man i'm gonna stop recording this we'll talk to you in a minute all right yeah thank you man